But basically, iSCSI is a protocol that's used on storage devices. Um, so all the attacks that we talk about today are primarily around storage devices um, and how basically you can get access to large volumes of data, significant volumes of data from these storage devices that are left insecure. So here's the kind of the agenda for the next hour and 15 minutes. I'm gonna be somewhat hopping around the slide deck. There is actually a new slide deck from the one that's in the big thick red book. So if you wanna download that from the Black Hat site or from the ISEC partner site, um, you're welcome to do so. So here's a little bit about who we are. I'm not gonna spend any time on it, but again, uh, we are an information security consulting, research, and tools company out there. Um, a couple of the presenters from ISEC talked this morning about web services. I specialize in storage security, primarily um, in fiber channel and NAS, and most recently iSCSI. Okay, so what is iSCSI? Well, the I stands for Internet Protocol, obviously, and SCSI stands for Small Computer Systems Interface. You put those together, and you get insecure SCSI. But seriously, what is iSCSI doing? Well, for the purpose of this presentation, it's the ability to access data blocks remotely over the network. So traditionally, those have been used in fiber channel SANs, where you have fiber channel HBAs, fiber channel switches, um, um, accessing data blocks. Well, the beauty of iSCSI, um, and why I think it's gonna be very, very popular, is now you don't have to set up all this infrastructure using fiber channel, but you can do that over your regular IP network. And no, it doesn't have to be gigabit IP. Obviously, if it is gigabit IP, it's a lot faster, but it doesn't have to be. So you have this entity that can provide large data blocks, large disk drives over your regular IP network. So that exchange server that's always running out of space can now be given 30 gigs, 300 gigs of data over the IP network without taking it down, without putting in another um, disk drive, without using any partition magic you know, software to screw things up or anything like that. So storage capacity becomes a lot easier um, there are inefficiencies using IP versus fiber channel, but again, using IP is a lot more flexible. So for those of you who do not know the difference between file and block level, I'm sure a lot of you already do, think of file level as SIFS, the NAS world, SIFS, NFS, and block level as the disk drive. Um, a very simple example, but that's the example that we'll use for the presentation. So what is ISK as a use in terms of security? Um, well, a variety of things, but three basic things, authentication, authorization, and encryption. Now, the authentication that it uses is CHAP, um, and you don't need me to tell you all the issues with CHAP. It's well documented in a lot of white papers and a lot of research papers. Even in the RFC for iSCSI points out the weaknesses in CHAP and why certain other things should be enabled. Um, the biggest issue, which is a very simple issue, is that authentication is disabled by default on a variety of storage devices. So, even if you have a storage device, you have to go in and manually turn on authentication because it is disabled by default. So why would anyone want to do that? Especially you connect to a network now and you always have to authenticate in some way, shape, or form to get access to the internet, but yet people aren't authenticating their own storage devices that have their own sensitive data and their own confidential information. Well, usually the answer is ease of use. How easy is it to set up this storage device, plug and play, and get things going? Um, which is a very true statement. Uh, having 13 or 14 clients authenticating to an iSCSI device is not necessarily easy to set up, but it's required if you're a security person. If you're coming at this from the security perspective, there should be no negotiation on authentication. But when you look at it, you're not talking to security people. You're talking to storage people who think about functionality, performance, uptime. That's the thing they live and die on. So when we talk about authentication, you start talking about things that are slowing down their process, the things that they do get paid for. So why should we care? Um, well, we should care because we're talking about large volumes of data. We're not talking about one table in a database, it, or we're not talking about a one operating system. You're talking about clusters of data that support multiple operating systems, multiple databases. And they're out there on the network for someone to compromise if you have deployed iSCSI by default, in its default state. So what are some of the vendors saying about iSCSI security? So I put this quote up, and I thought it was very interesting. Um, this kind of show the gap between storage and security people. Um, it basically says that you can't sniff or spoof or hijack an iSCSI communication unless you have physical access to the network. Now, you may or may not agree with this. You know, I, my personal opinions aside, I definitely don't agree with this statement for a variety of reasons, but um, what it's actually saying is that your internal network is secure. So you have to trust your internal network, and if you do, you're ready to go with iSCSI. So if you do trust your internal network, 
you probably are ready for iSCSI, but if you don't, if you don't trust those employees, those contractors, those consultants, those VPN users, wireless users, business partners, and whoever else is on the internal network, then maybe you want to look into iSCSI a bit further. But sometimes security professionals are forced to trust their internal network. We probably don't want to trust our internal network, but we don't have a choice. What other choice do we have? What can we actually do? Well, the fact is, is that iSCSI, or a lot of vendors will say, you know, there's nothing else you can do, so just plug and play, don't worry about authentication, because there's controls out there, there's firewalls out there. Well, maybe on the perimeter, but not internally, or most likely not internally. So if you deploy iSCSI in its default state, you're also agreeing to removing all the file permissions on your operating systems or your file servers, removing all, or allowing everyone to see everyone else's email, um, removing all the passwords from all your databases, um, allowing HR information to be out there for everyone to read, and telling those auditors that, you know what, those internal controls that you guys bug us about, we don't care about them, because we don't care about internal controls. So when you talk to your iSCSI vendor and they start saying, well, it's an internal issue, um, yeah, it is, a, it, it is an internal issue. Now, it can be an external issue, but the fact is, is that I don't think anyone would agree to these five concepts around their storage data or any kind of data. So why should iSCSI or why should any protocol, Fiber Channel, NAS, kind of get, up, get the get out of jail free card, especially when it's holding a lot of data in block format? Okay, so quick t on definitions and terms for those of you who do not know um, a little bit about it. Some of you may not. Some of you may already know, so you can kind of skip over this section. An iSCSI initiator is an iSCSI client. An iSCSI target is an iSCSI storage device appliance. I'm going to use those terms inter interchangeably, so hopefully I don't confuse anyone. And there's something called an ISNS server, a simple name server. What that is, for simplicity's sake, is a DNS server for storage devices. So you're going to have like hundreds of iSCSI clients and you know 30 iSCSI targets, and instead of having everyone like know where they should go to, use a simple name server, just like DNS. Instead of every operating system having a host file, you have a DNS server. Same thing for um, storage devices. You have a simple name server to kind of tell where everyone's at. Um, there's something called an initiator node name. That is basically the identity value of a system on an iSCSI storage network. So it's like your MAC address. And just like your MAC address, it's spoofable, but unlike your MAC address, the iSCSI drivers, the clients, actually have a feature to change this. They actually want you and allow you to change this at any point in time. It's sniffable, so it's clear text, um, and it's brute forceable. So the entity that, the unique ID that identifies you as an iSCSI client is vulnerable to a lot of common security issues. Um, domain sets, domain sets are basically groups of iSCSI clients and targets on your simple name server. So you might have an exchange domain set, a database domain set, uh, Oracle domain set, kind of logically segmenting the um, iSCSI network um, by the use of an initiator node name. And we'll get to more and more into these. I'm just going over the terms um, right now. And LUNs, logical unit numbers, that's basically if you have a 400 gigabyte storage array, you can break that up into four 100 gigabyte LUNs. So you can basically allocate your data from your storage device all over the network through different operating systems. Okay, so here's an iSCSI initiator. Um, basically, it's a regular operating system with iSCSI software. And notice I did not say special hardware. Unlike Fiber Channel, you do not need any special hardware to be an iSCSI client. You just download a driver. You can download it from Microsoft, HP, Cisco, IBM, you know, there are a variety of places. Um, and you put that on your laptop, your desktop, your server operating system, and instantly it's an iSCSI client and you have access to iSCSI targets. So you don't need any new hardware. Now you can buy an iSCSI HBA. You can buy an iSCSI card, and probably for performance reasons you want to do that. But it's not a requirement, it's an option. So if you want to be an iSCSI client right now, you just go and download a driver and your laptop is all of a sudden an iSCSI client. iSCSI targets, these are devices that have the controls or have the access to these large storage devices, I mean large storage units, large LUNs. So, Block data goes through these iSCSI storage devices, these iSCSI targets. Some of the vendors out there, Cisco, EMC, NetApp, HP, IBM, all the big boys in terms of storage, um, either have an iSCSI um, solution or are developing one um, because it's a very exciting technology. It's very cool. If it had more security, I would probably use it a lot, lot more. Um, and it listens on port 3260. 
So anytime you see port 3260 on your network, that's probably an iSCSI storage device. So again, this listens on any TCP port, just like FTP or uh, Telnet or anything of that sort. So here's an example, a simplistic example of how iSCSI works. On the left side of the screen, you have iSCSI initiators, iSCSI clients. On the right, time, on the right side, you have an iSCSI target, and it's listening on port 3260. And this iSCSI target has four LUNs divided up. So what would happen is the clients go ahead and connect to the target on 3260, and by default, the only thing they need to connect and get access to the correct data LUN, to the correct LUN, is the correct initiator node name. Again, the correct MAC address, if you will. So if they have the correct initiator node name, the iSCSI device will say, okay, you give me your initiator node name, I'm gonna look at it, and like, oh, okay, so in my internal table, I know that you should get access to LUN number two. So I'm gonna go ahead and give that to you. So what they do is go ahead and present their initiator node name, which is in pink and red, and at that point, the iSCSI target is gonna go ahead and present these LUNs over the network to these devices. And the operating system at this point is gonna see another drive show up on their operating system. The top one is the local drive, the bottom one is the network drive. And that's basically a simplistic example how iSCSI can work. So here's a kind of a review of that, where the top drive is the internal disk drive and the bottom one is over the network by the storage device, the iSCSI storage device. So you can see, if you're a storage person, the, the excitement around this because it makes a lot of things easier. And notice the operating system doesn't know the difference. The operating system thinks there's another storage device, another hard drive in its operating system in the desktop itself. Um, in fact, it really doesn't care because all it knows it has you know, 30 more gigs of data that it can start using immediately. Um, and lastly, with the introduction, simple name servers. So simple name servers can be software-based, so you can load it on your Unix or Windows operating system, or it can be a service on an iSCSI target. Um, more than likely, it's gonna be a service on an iSCSI target, but you can download the Windows simple name server and use that on a separate operating system itself. And just like DNS, it allocates you know, iSCSI, or allocates clients and servers so they can find each other, um, for this purpose, on iSCSI networks. This um, service listens on port 3205. So the two ports that you wanna keep in mind for iSCSI are th port 3260 and port 3205. If you see those on the network, they're probably an iSCSI entity and something that could be open to attack. So here is a, um, a simple name server model where a user would actually join and become part of a simple name server group. They go ahead and register with a simple name server, so they just send their IQN, their initiator node name, so the iSCSI target would do the same thing, and they build the table up. So each entity that registers with a simple name server gets put into something called the default domain set, or the domain set, or it's different for every vendor, but basically this one big default group where they put everything in. Because anyone can and register with a simple name server. You don't have to be trusted or untrusted. You can just register. Just like DNS, you can plug into the network and start you know, doing a, a look, host name lookups and things of that sort. But it can also have a separate exchange domain. So these two servers at the bottom are in a separate domain. So the ones in the exchange domain can't necessarily see the things in the default domain, and the default domain definitely can't see things in the exchange domain. So it's basically trust groups, but it's actually logical segmentation of Se um, clients and servers, so they don't really kind of step on each other's toes. So at this point, the simple name server is gonna tell the iSCSI client on the top left that you are allowed to see this iSCSI target in red, because that's in your domain group. We are now allowed to see the iSCSI targets in the exchange group because you don't belong to those. So when they queries information, it's gonna give information about the iSCSI target that it should have. Here's an example of the exchange groups. I'm sorry, of the uh, discovery domains and the uh, other domains. You have the exchange domain, database domain, discovery domain. Again, just a logical segmentation. Okay, so that's kind of wrapping up my intro part. So now we're gonna start talking about the security issues. So hopefully everyone gets a good feel of what iSCSI is, pretty simplistic. Um, and you're gonna see the t attacks that I'm talking about are probably even more simplistic. Um, if you're a security person, you're gonna be probably saying these are really trivial, um, and it's amazing that these things actually can happen. Um, and I, that's the same reaction I had when I started looking at iSCSI. These aren't sophisticated attacks. They're very simplistic, simplistic exact attacks, but when you have an attack surface, such as the connectivity of IP, 
and something that really has not been looked at in terms of security, you have some big problems. So what I'm trying to say is that you know, the companies, the storage companies haven't necessarily had to worry about security, um, either because people aren't asking for it. Um, I mean, now they are, but for the last five years, they kind of been thinking about it, but customers haven't really been understanding that, okay, do I need security on my storage devices? Well, now with iSCSI and now with all the data compliance issues, um, security and storage is becoming a big, big deal. So what are the top five security issues for iSCSI, in my opinion, and only in my opinion probably? Uh, one is the initiator node name, the values, the IQ and values are completely trusted. So it's like me trusting or a network trusting their MAC address and removing um, usernames and passwords, removing file permissions, um, removing you know anything and anything besides the MAC address. You are now your MAC address, and if you can change your MAC address, well, that sucks. Um, if you can sniff it, that sucks. If you can brute force it, that sucks. And iSCSI, that is completely trusted as a known value that a system is identified as. The second issue is that it's often the only value that's required for security. Now, I will say that you can enable authentication, and we'll get to problems when you actually do enable authentication, but the majority of ones that I've seen, and that's not necessarily an exhaustive search of all st storage vendors, but, but the majority of the time, authorization is the only thing required to get access to large data blocks. And when, uh, so authentication is disabled, but when you do enable authentication, it uses CHAP, and it doesn't use a different type of CHAP or a different implementation. Um, it uses CHAP as we know it. You know, all the security issues with CHAP are basically inherited by any iSCSI storage device that's using it um, pretty much out of the box. And number five, simple name servers. These groups or these entities that kind of manage the groups, these domains, are also vulnerable to attacks. They're not protected. And you can play games with a simple name server and get access to domains that you shouldn't have. And so these are my kind of top ten or top five. And the surrounding issue is that, you know, iSCSI is a clear text protocol. There is no encryption. Now, you can use encryption like IPsec. But um, for those of you who are here earlier in Mudge's talk, he, he talked about a couple interesting things with IPsec um, or with encryption. And iSCSI can use IPsec. So two years ago, I gave a talk about fiber channel security, and I said, you know, there's no inherent encryption, and that's bad. Well, iSCSI, there is. So someone could say, well, what's the issue? You, you want security, and now you have IPsec. But if you're a storage person, and you and a security person goes to the storage person and says, hey, I want you to use IPsec, um, and you know every call that the exchange server has to make to its local drive, which is actually over the network, is going to take an extra half second, that storage person is probably going to laugh in your face. They cannot accept performance issues. They cannot accept, you know, capacity issues and they cannot accept like downtime. So saying to a storage person that the ability to get access to your data is going to be significantly slower because I want you to use IPsec is not going to go over very well. Now I'm not a performance person and I'm a capacity planner so I do not have tons of tests to say that IPsec has no performance penalties but um, there's a gentleman at network computing that I've talked to and the performance issues are pretty big. So if you can enable IPsec that's great. But most times, I've still not seen a storage vendor using iSCSI that has enabled IPsec. And so hopefully I'll be um, seeing more and more of those, but it's not something you can easily do. It's like one of those great security recommendations on paper. You know, you see it on paper, it's a smart idea, but implementing it is very, very difficult. It's not just simply turn it on and everything just works. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do before we kind of jump in straight to the attacks is talk about enumeration. And the reason why I want to talk about this for just a few moments is, um, is because a lot of time I talk about you know, storage security, you know, fiber channel, NAS, iSCSI, and you know, someone always raises their hand and says, well, isn't it pretty difficult to find these things on the network? I mean, part of the security that a lot of storage people rely on is security by obscurity. You know, people are worried about the Windows operating system or the applications. So they're not going to look at storage, or they're not going to be able to find these storage networks. So we're going to go over three methods where you can find these iSCSI targets on your network. Now, there's more than three, but we're going to just use the top three methods to find these iSCSI targets on your network. But moreover, you know, the fact that is using IP and that IP is, you, once you connect to an internal network, you can find things. Now, another argument you'll hear is that, well, it's on the back-end network. Our iSCSI targets are on the back-end networks, so no one can get to them. 
Now, if that's a true statement, then that's a very good thing. If your backend network is truly segmented, trusted, and isolated, good for you. You're doing the right thing. The fact is, is that that Visio diagram where you have the web, um, web servers, application servers, database servers, and storage, that's great on paper, but that's not how IP works. You can get to anything. It's a switch, right? And switches switch. That's what they're made to do. So you can get access to it. So even though the Visio diagram has things in layers, unless you actually have built a back-end network that's not accessible to the core internal network, you can get to that storage network. These people don't. Question? Yeah, well, that's a good point. If you have VLANs, if you set up a VLAN on a back-end network, so trusted or isolated and segmented, then you're doing the right thing. But if you haven't, just saying that you know, people don't know where they are is not really a security control. Good question, or good point. OK, so how do you go ahead and enumerate your iSCSI target? Very simple, port scanning. Um, 3205 and 3260. Again, if you see these two ports, it's more than likely an iSCSI target on your storage network. Um, I've written a tool, uh, a very bad port scanner for storage only. Um, it's not better than Nmap. In fact, it's very, very crappy. But I've written it for people, storage people, who don't want to learn Nmap or don't really use port scanners all the time. It's a port scanner that's only going to be showing ports and protocols that storage devices use. So iSCSI, NAS, SIFS, things of that sort. Question? OK. So the question is, is, is there a way to change the port that an iSCSI storage device listens on? Um, in my experience, I have not seen that, but OK, there's a storage. Yes, you can. So you can. So that'd be another way to do it. Um, I wouldn't use that as a security control, though, but, um, but yeah, to kind of ma uh, change the port that you can listen on. But traditionally, the RFC is 3260 and 3205. Do you guys know if you guys can change yours or? No. Nope. Okay, there's a couple other vendors who say no. So some vendors can, some vendors can't. Okay, so again, if you want to, if you don't want to, if you're a storage person who doesn't use port scanners, you can use store scan. But what I recommend is using Nmap and looking for these two ports on your network to find your targets. Um, the second method is just registering with a simple name server. Again, the simple name server will accept anyone to register, um, just like DNS. So you register with a simple name server, and then instantly you will be told all the targets in the domain that you belong to, which will probably be the default domain, the default domain set, if you are a malicious target, if you're just someone that connected to the network. But you're going to be instantly told that, hey, you're an iSCSI client. Here are all the targets that you can target. Here are all the targets that you can try attacking. Um, and it gives that information away freely. It doesn't try to keep that. It's not a, it's not a security tool. It's a you know, logical segmentation tool. And an SNS server is basically giving out information freely. To kind of show that, I'm going to show a quick video. As people say, a picture says a 1,000 words. Well, to me, a video is like 10,000 PowerPoint slides. So I have a whole bunch of videos that I like to show. So here's me scanning the, um, actually scanning one simple name server instead of the entire network. You can do the class C or class B, whatever you want to do. And you're going to see here that um, port 3205 shows up. So at this point, I'm going to open up my Microsoft iSCSI client. And again, you don't have to use the Microsoft client. You can use any client. So don't pay attention to the UI because the UI is not important, but you open up an iSCSI client. And basically, you register with a simple name server down here at the bottom. So you go ahead and click Add and type in the IP address that you found listening on port 3205. And then you go to Hidden Targets, and now you can see here are the targets that are on the iSCSI network. So you just found one target. It's Pretty much that simple if you're trying to look for a potential target to try to attack. But if you guys were listening closely earlier, what if a storage person or storage administrator said, OK, I know that anyone can register with my simple name server, so I'm not going to put anything trusted in this default domain set. I'm going to get rid of them. And I'm going to put them in the exchange domain or the trusted domain or the Oracle domain. So if you do happen to do that second method to enumerate your target, it's only going to be targets that I don't trust. So have fun with them because I don't care about them. 
Well, another thing you can just simply do to get around that is do a man in the middle attack against a simple name server. Because it's listening on IP and it's vulnerable to all the IP attacks, which aren't new attacks, and sniffing on a switch or sniffing on an IP network is nothing new, all you have to do is put yourself in the middle of the simple name server and its clients and all the traffic will come to you first. And once the traffic comes to you, you can enumerate all the initiator node names of the targets, the clients, basically everything. No matter if they're in a trusted domain or they're in an untrusted domain, the default domain, you have all that information. So at that point, you can just set up your sniffer and collect that information as you would like. So those are the three methods you can enumerate iSCSI targets. Actually, more than, again, there's more than three methods, but that's one of many methods, three of them we've shown to enumerate your target. So let's now start talking about the attacks. So again, as I said earlier, the initiator node name is the entity that's required for security. It's the one thing that's required. What is the initiator node name? So let's break it down a little bit more. It's basically made up of four different parts. Type, date, the reverse domain name of the naming authority, and for the Microsoft one, the host name. If you have a Cisco, IBM, HP, or something else, the last part is gonna be different. But the point is, three of the four things that make up the initiator node name are gonna be static values that are known. So think of your MAC address. Every MAC address usually has um, some vendor specific um, part of it, usually the beginning. Same idea with the initiator node name. All the three of the four, the three first parts are gonna be something vendor specific and are gonna be known. The last part is what you have to guess, what you have to brute force. So for Windows, it's pretty easy because it's really easy to get everyone's host name on the Windows network. So you get the host name of your exchange server, you change your initiated node name to, to the one that your exchange server is probably using, and now you are the exchange server. And that is how simple it can, can be. Or if you just want to brute force, you can just brute force a key space. Now it might take you some time, but you can brute force a key space that's not very long because again, three of the four things are known and not unknown. But the fact is, is again, iSCSI is a clear text protocol. So you can just sniff it over the network. You know, if you want to do the hard part in brute force, you can do that, or you can just do the easy part and sniff it over the network, get the initiator node name. And these initiator node names, I don't think I've said this, they're like passwords. They're better than passwords, you know, because they give you access. So you harvest them. You just collect them as you're scanning the network, and these are things you can use to get access to data. That's a good point. Uh, save that comment because I'm going to actually talk about how you, you, you're, you're correct, but there's a way where you can just be patient enough and get around that issue. So the comment um, he made is that iSCSI or block um, communication is different from like file level. Like you can have uh, two NFS clients accessing the same NFS file system or SIFs or the same sort. But in block format, you can't have two clients with the same initiated node name accessing the same data block. You can't have the same hard drive in two different machines. So that's the point he's making. But there's a way where you can be patient and actually get around that. But that is a true statement. So we'll just get to that in about two seconds. So what we're gonna do is sniff the um, iSCSI communication on port 3260, um, spoof the initiator node name, and get access to data. So here's the architecture that we're gonna set up. You get the trusted client at the top, you get an IP switch, and you get an iSCSI storage device with two LUNs, LUN one and LUN two. On the bottom, you have the attacker who's sniffing the network. So the architecture is where the IQN um, of the trusted machine ends with win2003-hd, and that is allocated to LUN1. Very simple. Now, the IQN of the malicious machine ends with Jumanji, and that has allocated nothing, has no access. So what the user is gonna do, or the malicious user, they're gonna sniff the network, spoof their initiator node name to the one of their target, and then get access to data, and we re represent this. And as the gentleman just said, at this point, there's two initiated, two clients with the same initiator node name trying to access the same block of data. So what happens instantly is a denial of service attack. So at this point, a denial of service attack is that legitimate exchange server can access this data, and neither can the attacker. So if you're just trying to get data offline, you've succeeded in doing that. But what if you actually want data? So you can do one of two things. You can be patient 
and you can do what most humans do, which is when an exchange server has lost its data, you can look at it and see if you can reboot the server or reinitialize the service. Now, maybe that's not gonna happen, but I would say eight times out of 10, one of, those, one of the two things are gonna happen. At that point, there's only gonna be one iSCSI client trying to access that piece of data. And at that point, you will have access, the malicious user will have access to the data. That might be for five seconds, five minutes, five days, but it's probably enough time where enough information, well, not enough, but some information can be compromised in an unauthorized way. That's the passive way, the patient way. If you wanna be an aggressive attacker, you would do this attack and then you would do a denial of service attack against the client. So you take the client offline, get rid of that, and then now you're the only person trying to access that piece of data, LUN1, and that's how you get access. But, as you said earlier, if you have two clients always trying to access the same data, it's a denial of service attack, but you never get your data also. So, it's not a complete loss, but you're still vulnerable to a denial of service, which, if you talk to any storage person, might not be the best thing also. Question? No, so the question was, are you doing the denial of service attack against a client with iSCSI? The answer is yes. The moment you spoof your initiator node name, and you send that, so you're now becoming like the exchange server, and you have someone who is the exchange server, and you're both sending these packets, that's the denial service. So not in terms of security denial service, you know, if that makes sense. So yeah, as soon as you do that, you've taken something offline. Okay, so in my experience, that's not what I've seen. Um, so, so we'll yeah, so we'll talk, yeah. Because what I've seen is as soon as that happens, both machines can't get access to the data. Um, you know, the client, well, the client that's trying to connect to you will pay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like a drop by drop, but the, the attacker client. Yeah, the attacker client. But the, the, the legitimate one in your experience doesn't. Okay, that's exactly opposite what I've received. Yep, and so what the gentleman just said is that if you have these issues between vendors that you might have a denial service, if you don't, you could just simply do a layer two um, man in the middle attack and have everything route to yourself. So you don't have to worry about denial service attacks, you don't have to worry about some vendors being offline, you just redirect everything to yourself and get access, so you're not only layer two, the identity of the target, but with iSCSI, the identity of your target. So both aspects will guarantee you the right to, or guarantee you the access to that data, not definitely the right. Good point. So to kind of show this in real time, let's show a video. Okay, so here's um, an example attack. Um, and the black screen is the attacker. In a second, I'm gonna move over to a blue screen, which is the trusted user. So if we go back for a second, you're gonna see two screens. This guy here at the bottom, is the black operating system, and this one here is the blue operating system. So if we go back. One second. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so this is the attacker, and they're just gonna open up a sniffer. Um, this is done in a lab environment, because you don't wanna do this in production data. Let me repeat that. Um, so obviously I don't need to do a man in the middle attack here, but in, if you, yeah, so I'm sniffing the network on a lab environment. Um, can't emphasize that enough. Um, just bring up your favorite sniffer, Ethereum or whatever you want. And now you can see we're sniffing the network and here's the trusted system, the trusted client. And all the trusted, the trusted client is gonna go ahead and connect to its iSCSI target. Um, you can see down there has the initiated node name of win2003-hd, and that correlates to the host name of the machine, again, which is only default by a Microsoft client, but I'm just showing you how that works. 
Um, and what we're going to do here is just connect to our target. So we go ahead and connect to our target and log in. And we're instantly connected here. And you're going to see a new drive. This local drive is the local disk drive, and the new volume is the one that's over the network. So we're going to go ahead and open this. Again, we're the legitimate user, so nothing is out of the ordinary at this point. So we're going to open this file called, this is a test, and we're going to add the word test. So we know that this is exactly the file that we're using that's about to be compromised, or the, the data block, I should say, not the file. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and open our disk management utility. And here is, down here, the one over the network, the disk drive over the network, disk one, and of course disk zero is the local one on the operating system itself. Okay, now that I've done that, I'm gonna go back to the attacker's machine who's been sniffing the network, and I'm gonna open up those iSCSI packets, and you're gonna see right there in the clear the initiator node name. Right here, that ends with win2003-hd. So again, what you want is in clear text. So you're gonna go ahead and take that and put it into a log file. So if you're actually doing a, a security test on your storage environment, you'd probably just sniff for a long time and just harvest these out of your log files, your ethereal log files, and just gather these. Go ahead and hit save, or go ahead and save it. You don't need the sniffer anymore. So open up your iSCSI driver. Again, this is the Microsoft one that I happen to use. And before I do anything that, you're gonna see only one drive here, the local disk, nothing else. So just remember that as the before. And I'm also gonna show you the disk management utility so you can see only one drive. Again, the before shot. So again, one disk. Okay, so now that we have that down, let's go ahead and spoof. So let's go ahead and change our initiator node name. Again, our initiator node name ends with Jumanji because that's what the machine name is. So we go ahead and change that. And you can see there's a change button to allow us to do that nice and easily. So copy the last half, paste it, change, and now we're gonna go ahead and connect to that iSCSI target. But now we have spoofed ourselves, so we're in a new identity. We're not Jumanji anymore, we're Win2003-HD, and now we're gonna to connect to that storage device. So we hit okay, we're connected. Now if we go to the attacker's machine, you see that new volume that wasn't there before. So now we've just taken that entire data block from the iSCSI device, um, from the iSCSI target, and basically stolen it, hijacked it, compromised it. At this point, we have a denial of service attack, in my experience, that two machines trying to access the same piece of data. So you have two options, um, actually three options. Um, you can be patient and hope for a reboot. Um, you could do an aggressive denial of service attack, or you can just do a layer two man in the middle attack and make sure all the packets go out to you so you can keep that new volume. So even though you can see it, if I double click on it, my machine hangs, and when I double clicked on the legitimate user, their machine hung. So basically both machines didn't have access to the data. So you want do one of three options to get control of the data. In this experience, in this simple lab test, what I did is basically reinitialize the service because it got it hung, it couldn't get access to its own data, and at that point, you're gonna see from the attacker's machine, um, just a second here. You hit the new volume, and the attacker's machine open up that file that we modified, and you can see it's the same file. With test, test, and if you go back to the attacker's machine and open up disk management, in just a second. Oh, I guess I don't, okay. 
it must have been a different video file. I, I don't open up disk management, but if I would open up disk management, you would see a second hard drive that the attacker just has access to. So all they did was sniff the network, copy the initiative node name, and got access to you know, another gig of data that they shouldn't have. So to kind of show that attack again, and kind of reinforce that, um, I'm gonna show a, pretty much the same attack, but with a lot more data. In this example, you have a initiated node name that starts, or that's a Cisco client, and this client has access to LUNs one through five, um, with the same attack, or with a different attacker that has the initiated node name of Win2003. Again, they're gonna sniff the network, spoof their initiated node name, and get access to data. So, let me load this one up. Let's see if it's the right one. And I'm, actually, I'm gonna skip to the part where, where they spoof their info. Okay, right here. So here is the attacker in a different attack. Disk management, you only see one disk, disk zero. So at this point, they've already sniffed the network. Um, they have an initiated node name. They're gonna go ahead and open up their My Microsoft iSCSI client, change their initiated node name, just a second here. Well, first they're gonna go ahead and um, type the IP address of their iSCSI target. And at this point, if they log on, actually, um, this is actually good. I'm gonna go ahead and log on um, so I've been allowed to connect, but I did not spoof my initiator node name. And you'll notice nothing changes. So even though I, allow, I was allowed to connect, I have the wrong, I have the incorrect initiator node name, so I didn't get access to any data. So I have to go back and spoof my initiator node name. So it's just a simplistic example, just to reinforce the fact that you can connect here, but connection doesn't do anything. You must have the correct initiator node name. And this goes back to the statement I said earlier, that the initiator node name is a trusted entity. It's a trusted value. It's not something that is just there as a possible identifier, it's the identifier on the iSCSI storage network. So you go ahead and hit change um, after you spoofed, after you changed your initiated node name. Hit log on, hit okay. Now you're connected, but now you're connected with a new initiated node name. And now you go with the disk management and it's gonna take couple seconds here because you're gonna have access to more disks than you did before. But you go into disk management and now with the new initiated node name that you sniffed over the network, you're gonna have access to 230 gigs of data without a single password. Skip over that. So at this point, again, you're doing a denial of service attack but you can d delete this data outright if you want to. You can do whatever you want and you can see these disk drives that were not there are now there now for you to reformat, delete. Now, if you wanna read them, again, you have to do one of the three attack options, man in the middle, aggressive denial of service, or just waiting out the legitimate user to reboot. But at that point, you're gonna have access to those 230 gigs of data. So the, so hopefully, okay. So one of the things that people do to stay away from these attacks is use domain sets. We talked about domain sets and what they were, but Obviously, giving people access to data with the initiated node name is a bad idea because it's pretty wide open, in my opinion. But, so domain sets can be used to kind of segment things so things can't see each other, right? So, yes, you can do this, but let's keep our exchange servers in a different domain so no one can get access to them. Well, the problem is, is they rely on the initiated node name also. They're relying on a, an entity that's not trusted, that shouldn't be trusted. So, you can do a simple name server domain hopping attack, which is similar to a VLAN hopping attack or a zone hopping attack. You change your initiator node name, you re-register with a simple name server, and then you will become your target. You will become that client that is trusted even though you are the malicious attacker. So in this example, you have a client that registers with a simple name server, and they have the IQN of Win2003, and you have the, I'm sorry, that's the legitimate user. You have the attacker that registered with a simple name server, that has the IQN that ends with ISEC. So what happens is the simple name server creates a table and it says this unknown entity called ISEC is not trusted, so I'm gonna put them in the default domain set. And the two entities that I do trust, Win2003 and the iSCSI target, 
I am going to put it in a trusted domain, so it's separated. And maybe that iSCSI target has like financial information or you know, um, source code or something that your company wants to protect. Well, the attacker, all they need to do is change or spoof their initiator node name to Win2003, re-register with a simple name server, and when that happens, the entity, which is the, pretty much the host name of the attacker, will, I'm sorry, the IQN of the attacker will be Win2003, but the entity that it's recognized as from the simple name server will change from Win2003 to ISEC. So you can see here, down here, the entity changes and now it's just hopped across domains. But as always, this is easier to show with a example. So here is the simple name server software on this operating system. Again, it doesn't matter that this is a Microsoft software, it's the, it's the protocol itself that's the issue. We have a trusted domain called Trusted with our two trusted clients. One is the Win2003, and the entity that it's recognized as is the Win2003, and of course the iSCSI target that's also trusted. What we don't trust is the IQN that is called ISEC, which we'll see here in just a second. So this default domain, this you know, catch-all domain, has the malicious user called ISEC. So in a second here, I'm gonna bring up the client software of the malicious machine. So for resolution reasons, you're, it's gonna be on the bottom of the screen, but it's a different machine that's the host operating system. This is actually our uh, RDP session of a different mi machine right here. So what we're gonna do is bring up the client and spoof our iSCSI, or I'm sorry, our initiated node name to the trusted value, which is Win2003. So here's the malicious attacker, and you can see their IQN is, ends with ISEC. And you can see they've registered with the, uh, let me go back here, actually, forget it. Um, they've registered with the simple name server, and the targets they have access to is none. They have absolutely no access because they're not trusted. So this is a good way so that it's supposed to work. But as soon as they change their um, um, initiated node name, they're gonna be able to hop across domains. So they go ahead and change it to Win2003, hit OK, now they're going to have to re-register with a simple name server. So basically, you got to delete this and add it back in. So type in the IP address of your simple name server. So you're re-registering. And at this point, you're going to go back to the simple name server. And notice nothing has changed. But in a second, when I hit refresh, the entity that I'm circling right here is going to change from Win2003, which is the trusted client, to the entity called ISEC, which is the untrusted client. But it's gonna be still recognized as the spoofed initiated node name, virtually hopping across domains. And as you can see here, now it's being recognized as the ISEC malicious client. Now if you go back to the client for further proof, you're gonna see that the client now has access to a target that it shouldn't have access for, to in the beginning, right here. So I showed you before, nothing was there, and now that I spoof my initiated node name, I do have access to this trusted client, and now I can perform more attacks. So, at this point of the presentation, you should be pretty much convinced that authorization values in iSCSI are not good. You know, I think I beat that point to death. So what about authentication? You should be asking yourself, okay, I understand authorization is not the best thing to do in iSCSI, so I'm gonna enable CHAP. Am I good then? Well, to some degree, I would still say you're not that much better, because CHAP, again, is not a strong authentication protocol. Again, you don't need me to tell you that. It's, again, have been documented multiple times. Now, the testing I've done with iSCSI CHAP has not looked um, too favorable. Three things kind of point out to me. Um, still, usernames are in the clear. Um, it's vulnerable to offline brute forcing attacks, and it's also vulnerable to message reflection attacks. So we're gonna talk about these attacks um, in depth at this point. So how does CHAP work? So some of you probably already know how CHAP works, um, some of you who may not, so let me kind of break that down for just a moment. Again, I'm not a CHAP expert, but to my understanding from the iSCSI RFC, this is how it works. So and a client is gonna request authentication to, from a target, right? And CHAP is okay with sending usernames in clear text. You know, in security, that's still not a good idea, but CHAP is okay with doing that. It's not comfortable sending passwords in clear text. So what it's gonna do is make an MD5 of the password and send that along. But actually that's not a smart idea either because then they're vulnerable to replay attacks because that MD5 hash 
of your password is going to be the same. So every English word in the dictionary could be could have an MD5 hash, and it's going to be a password equivalent. It's not going to be unique. It's not going to be it's not going to be any much any more bet any better than sending the password itself if you just take a hash. So what Chap does is says, well, hey client, don't just send me an MD5 hash of your password. I'm going to send you an ID, a random ID, and a random challenge. So I want you to take your secret, and I want you to take this challenge and ID I give to you, put everything together, concatenate everything together, and take a hash of that, and you send me that. And every time someone tries to authenticate against me, I'm going to send them a different challenge, so it's never going to be the same hash. And that way, you do not have to send me the password in clear text or a password equivalent. You're sending me something unique. So the target is going to go ahead and say, OK, you want to authenticate? Here's the CHAP ID and the CHAP challenge, which in our example is 194 and E500370B. So the client's going to say, OK, here's my equation. Here's what I have to do. The ID is 194. The secret, I know the secret. So I'm going to go ahead and, and put that there, combine that with the challenge, take an MD5 hash, and send it to the target. The target, it's going to take that hash and it's going to say, OK, I sent you the ID and the challenge, so I know that. I also know the secret, so I'm going to do the same thing. And if we get the same hash, then I know you have the correct password. But if you don't have the correct password, your hash is going to be different because everything else I sent you is the same, the ID and the challenge. So if you don't have the correct hash, I know you don't have the right password. So that's basically how it works. So in this example, they have the same hash. They're authenticated. But the attacker here at the bottom is able to sniff three of the four entities that are required to get the chat secret, the chat password, right? So even though we have protected ourselves against a replay attack, we've exposed ourselves to an offline brute forcing attack. So what does that actually mean? So if you put that equation into mathematical terms, think of it this way. What is um, x if the sum of 1 plus x plus 5 divided by 2 equals 5? Now we could figure that out using math, or we could just brute force it. So we'll start with the number 1. Well, 1 plus 1 plus 5 equals 7, divided by 2 is 3.5. That is not equal 5. What about number 2? Nope, that equals 4. What about number 3? 1 plus 3 plus 5 equals 8. Um, no, 1 plus 3 plus 5 equals 9, divided by 2 equals 4.5. It's not correct either. What about 4? 1 plus 4 plus 5 equals 10, divided by 2 equals 5 equals 5. So I know that's a very simplistic example, but that's what an offline brute force attack would be. So we use the same idea, the exact same idea in an offline brute forcing attack of CHAP. We've captured the CHAP ID in clear text, we've captured the challenge in clear text, and we captured the hash in clear text. So the only thing we don't have is the secret. So if you go to our equation at, uh, above, we will brute force passwords. We'll start with the word hello. And we'll go through the entire English dictionary until we get a hash that matches the hash that we sniffed over the network. And once we get a hash that matches, we know we have guessed the correct password. Now, this might take a long time if you have a strong iSCSI secret, iSCSI chap secret. And that's a good thing to do. But it won't if you have a common dictionary word. But at some point, um, this, uh, at some point that this attack can be done um, pretty much as long as you want it to be executed because it's not like three attempts and you're out or you only have a certain time. Because it's offline, you can run this attack indefinitely. So what I have done is kind of written a uh, proof of concept tool to kind of go over this with the help of Jesse Burns, who also works for ISEC Partners, to kind of go over this and kind of demonstrate it. So what we're going to do is kind of use that as an example. Whoops. So first thing the tool is going to ask you is, what is the password you want to test? So let's say I want to test the word hello. I think they're using the password of hello. So next thing is saying, OK, you need the CHAP ID number. What is the CHAP ID number? Again, this is something I sniff over the network. So we've already talked about sniffing quite a bit. So here is another lab environment. Let me. Uh, Put that to full screen. OK, so here's a connection, a CHAP connection that's sniffed over the network. Um, so we're going to go ahead and open that. And you're going to see the initiator node name. But at this point, we don't care about the initiator node name because they're using CHAP. So you know, authorization attacks do no good to us. What we do need is the CHAP ID and the CHAP challenge. 
which you're going to see right here. Here's the CHAP ID, which is 194, and the CHAP challenge, which is 500370B. Again, you're just snipping across in the network. So we're going to go ahead and put that into our tool. 194 is the ID, and the challenge was E500370B. The last thing we need is the hash, which is denoted by the CHAP underscore R um, value. So we go back to our sniffer. And you can see here is the resulting hash. And by the way, here's the iSCSI username in clear text also, but that's not a big deal at this point. So here's the resulting hash. So I need to go back to my tool and type in the hash that I snipped over the network, which is C0D74FD2BE122CC891E362. All right, so here's the hash that I snipped over the network. So three things I sniffed, the ID, the message challenge, and the resulting hash, and I'm going to test the password of hello and see if the, at the end? Oh, oh okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, and you can see that my password is incorrect. The hash that I guessed is not matching the hash that I sniffed. So the password is not hello. So you would try this. You would go over and over and do this. This tool is a proof of concept. We're going to actually write a tool where you can load the entire dictionary and not do this manually because that would take forever. But once you basically have access to that tool, which should be very soon, you're going to be, do, be able to do something like this. You're going to be able to go down every single word in the English dictionary until you find the hash that matches the hash that you sniffed over the network. And again, as I said before, once the hash is matched, you know you have the correct password. So in this example, we got a hash that matched, and our secret turns out to be ISA SCSI security. Now, I want to make sure that it could be 10 or it could be 10, or 10,000 or 100,000 attempts. But it really doesn't matter because, again, it's offline. All you have to do is capture one iSCSI authentication session, and you can do this attack, and it eventually gets the secret. So to go back to our tool, um, just to demonstrate this, let's try iSCSI security. The ID was 194. The challenge was E50370B. The hash I have saved. And at this point, you can see we're told you have the correct password. And that's what the end result would be to the offline dictionary attack. And at this point, you've been able to get into the iSCSI target, even though it's enabled authentication because the weaknesses with CHAP itself. And here's a screenshot of that. OK, so the last attack um, that we're going to talk about, I'm doing pretty good on time so far, is the message reflection attack. So this is attack where you have two connections. And you have two connections, one's in blue and one's in red. Now you have an attacker, the malicious client, and the iSCSI target. Same scenario as before. People are convinced now that you know, not enabling authentication on storage devices is bad, so they enable CHAP. And you know, even though people can sniff over the network, maybe this attacker doesn't want to sniff. They want to do something more simple. Um, so what they're going to have to do is a message reflection attack. And what this means is basically opening up two connections with the iSCSI target and getting, basically tricking the target to use its own ID and challenge against itself to create the correct hash. And so what does that really mean? So again, an iSCSI client, the malicious client, is going to try to authenticate against the target. So the target's going to say, okay, you want to authenticate? You know the routine. Here's the challenge ID and here's the, ha um, here's the challenge and here's the ID. Give me the correct hash after you concatenate this with the real secret. Well, the attacker is going to say, well, I don't know the real secret. I, that's the whole issue. I don't know the real secret, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up a second connection, and that second connection, I'm going to try to get you to authenticate against me. Now, this attack, um, I became familiar with this attack actually when Jesse Burns and actually Sir Distic kind of introduced it in the SMB world, and it's the same concept. And so basically, I'm going to tell the target that I want you to authenticate against me. Now, depending on the vendor, some vendors, some products will go ahead and say, okay, I didn't ask to authenticate against you, but I will go ahead and do that. 
Some products won't do that. So it kind of depends on the vendor, the storage vendor. But in this um, lab environment, if you present a challenge and ID to an iSCSI target, it will respond with saying, okay, I'll go ahead and authenticate. What is the challenge in the ID? So the challenge in ID is gonna be what? It's gonna be the same challenge in ID from the first connection. So the attacker is gonna send the same challenge in ID from the first connection to the target. And the target's gonna say, okay, so give me the ID, give me the challenge, and I know the secret, and I'm gonna go ahead and put it in my CHAP equation here and create the right hash. And I'm gonna go ahead and send that hash back to you because, again, I guess I'm supposed to authenticate against you. Now, the attacker has just been given the correct hash to authenticate against the target in the first connection. So it's gonna go back to its first connection and it's gonna send the hash that it, was, that it received from the target in the second connection. And this is the correct hash because you're using the same ID and the same challenge with the correct password. And at this point, the iSCSI client is gonna be authenticated to the iSCSI target without knowing the secret with a message reflection attack. Okay, and so I know I'm running out of time, so those are the core iSCSI attacks that I have to talk about. There's two issues, petty issues, they're not even iSCSI issues, so um, I kind of put them in here only if we'd have time. One is that if you use the Microsoft iSCSI client, it logs um, things in the clear. The only reason why I put that in there because Event Viewer is accessible over the network via the remote registry service. So if you put in a, um, a iSCSI secret that is not long enough, it's logged incorrectly in the log file. So something to keep in mind. And another thing, if you do enable CHAP or if you do enable IPsec, it doesn't store it securely in the Microsoft driver. So this is only a Microsoft driver. Why this is important is because if you have enabled authentication, you've probably done it on all your iSCSI clients. Now, if you're a security person, you're probably using unique secrets and unique, um, unique shared secrets and unique passwords. But if you're a storage person, you might not want to maintain 16 or 17 different passwords. So you might be using one or two. So the thing is, if someone gets access to um, one of the 17 iSCSI clients and using the same secret, the same CHAPS password, then potentially you allow that person to get access to all the CHAP clients and virtually all the iSCSI target information that they shouldn't have access to. Again, a very petty problem. It's not a big deal, but something worth noting. Um, so how do you defend against these attacks? Um, because there are things you can do now that, to defend against these. Um, and in my opinion, just like everything else, configuration, configuration, configuration. iSCSI, just like everything else on your network, needs to be configured correctly. By default, it's set up to work, to plug and play. It's not set up securely. Just like everything else you've seen out there, router switches, operating systems, applications, they're set up to work, they're not necessarily set up securely. So you have to pay attention to your storage devices. They're operating systems, they run on TCP ports, and they have access to data. On most, if not all, the storage devices that I've come across on, there are things you can do to protect against all, most, if not all, these attacks. But people don't do it because the education's not out there of why you should do this. So to go over those things, one thing you can do right away is enable mutual authentication. So if you enable mutual authentication, which is, yes, not the easiest thing to do, but if you do that, it will be, um, your offline brute forcing attack will go away. Um, if you do create multiple discovery domains, it does limit the amount of enumeration someone can do. Now you can do, still do domain hopping, but you wanna make the attacker do their homework. Just don't give them that information away for free. Um, CRC checksums you can enable. Um, again, you can enable IPsec where possible. Again, I kinda say that um, kind of haphazardly because I know that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, in fact, that's a very difficult thing to do um, in an enterprise environment. But number five is my most important one. Do not rely on initiated node names. And if you do enable authentication, be aware of CHAP attacks and what you can do, like things like mutual authentication to prevent against um, CHAP message reflection attacks or offline brute forcing attacks. Uh, vendors, something better than CHAP would be great. Obviously, Kerberos is the ideal um, mechanism, but CHAP, to me, as a security person, is just not strong enough. Um, but more importantly, I'd like to see vendors enable authentication by default, or at least tell their customers that, hey, we have disabled it, but here's something, here are reasons why you should enable it if you have anything sensitive on this iSCSI target. And of course, if you read the RFC uh, for the simple name server or for iSCSI, there's a lot of good security suggestions that have been ignored um, right in the RFC. 
One for simple name server where you can authenticate heartbeat messages that would prevent against domain hopping attacks. So that's something that, that would be also very good to see to prevent domain hopping attacks as an option on these simple name servers that you have out there. And that's my last slide. So if you have questions, there's my email address. Uh, a very shameful plug for myself is uh, I've written a book on securing storage. It talks about this stuff as well as NAS, SIFS, and Fiber Channel. Um, if you're interested, we can talk later. But at this point, I think I have about five minutes for questions. Questions? So the question is, uh, sorry, okay. So the question is, isn't a lot of this mitigated to having a separate data network? And yes, I would say so. If you have an iSCSI target, um, iSCSI device, and you've isolated, you've created a separate data network, you have VLANs, you maybe have router ACLs, or maybe even an internal firewall, where your backup network is not part of your internal network, so those are three enumeration um, possibilities I showed you would not work, then yes, that's a great way to mitigate it. In my experience, it's, I haven't seen that so much, I've seen customers who've said they wanted to do it, but it's not the, it's talked about re-segmenting your internal network. But. Right. Right. Yep, and that's a great suggestion, so if you use Private isolated VLANs, basically you plug into a switch, but you're only allowed to see groups within your own VLAN, so, or, I mean, entities within your own VLAN, you're not gonna be able to find the targets. Now, if you've done that, that's a great way to truly segment your network in your iSCSI storage network. However, um, if your Exchange server, let's say your Exchange server is one of these iSCSI clients, you gotta make sure that because the Exchange server has to be accessible to every client on the internal network, that's obviously not being, um, I guess, spoofed from layer two attacks, or obviously iSCSI attacks using the initiated node name. But yeah, there's tons of IP-centric segmentation things you can do, including ACLs. I mean, these are TCP ports. You know, we know how to segment TCP ports. We know how to filter, but you have to look at iSCSI and, and apply to these things also. The challenge is, is they're internal and they could be all over the place, and just not, you know, out there on the perimeter. Question. Do all vendors use the same Do all vendors use the same version of CHAP? I don't think I really could answer that because I haven't seen all vendors. Um, I've done tests. The tests that I've done, they're, for the major vendors, I would say yes. The major vendors, the offline brute forcing attack, all these things have worked. Um, actually, if you're interested um, and you don't have enough, like you don't have $200,000 laying around to buy an iSCSI target, um, there's a free software that you can download called WinTarget. I don't work for them. I don't know these guys, but basically it's an iSCSI target for your Windows operating system and you can play around with some of these attacks. Um, but to my knowledge, I would say yes, but I can't honestly say yes or no for sure. Uh, I think you and then you, sorry. So what the gentleman is just saying is that if you even use VLANs, you still have the problem with layer two attacks. So layer two attacks, I mean, it's, we're not talking about VLAN hop hopping, we're basically saying that, hey, on the network, using ARP broadcast and ARP pollution, I am who you think I am because you're routing through me. And if you're routing through me, I can get access to that data, maybe not through the iSCSI portion, but again, through the layer two attack. Right. Uh, I don't know because, yeah, I mean, I think that's open to, the, the comment, is, uh, the comment is, is that if you have layer two attacks, you have different problems or your problems might not be your targets. And I think um, that de really depends on the organization. In my opinion, and only in my opinion, you know, this is your data. You know, it's a large portion of your data. Um, to me, that would be a priority as well as everything else, but because just because it's iSCSI target does not mean that it, the switch is more important because switch is an access entity, right? Where the data is what people are trying to get after, you know, or either delete, compromise, modify, or, or what have you. Yeah, so, the, but yeah, I agree with that statement. So there's other things you have to fix outside of the iSCSI target, but 
iSCSI by using IP is now embracing those, right? It's kind of saying, okay, we're gonna use IP. So it can't shy, in my opinion, it can't shy away, like that's not our problem because it became their problem when they started supporting iSCSI, if that makes sense. That's a good, so uh, let me see if I got the question correctly. The IPsec, if you can use IPsec without encryption just for the authentication headers, I don't. But I don't, I'm not even sure if it's, I mean maybe one of the vendors can speak, I'm not sure, per, sure if authentication headers are only supported um, with IPsec. Like I know obviously the payload can be encrypted, but I don't know if you have the option should they only do um, authentication headers for authentication instead of CHAP. Right. No, I mean that's a good point. I mean it would be interesting again, um, to basically dump CHAP and use IPsec for authentication. Again, I have not seen a vendor that actually support that in any manner. And I'm totally out of time, so I apologize. And I guess, <laughs> thank you everyone, by the way. Thanks for your questions, um, and I'll be around afterwards. Oh, that's funny.